Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three Shadow Dark supplements. These are absolutely fantastic, um, but they're very, very different. The first is going to be Letters from the Dark, Volume 8, Lucky Stars. Now, this is a preview version that I was sent by the creator um, very generously. He reached out and uh, sent it over, so thank you to that. Uh, thank you to him for this. Uh, the full PDF is 100 pages. This is only 43, and parts of it are redacted because I think there's some surprises that he wants to keep back, and so um, so you'll you'll be able to see a lot of what this book will offer, but not the whole thing in this flip through. In the next, one, uh, the second one I'm going to be going through is Righteous Vow Volume One, which is a new RPG zine series that's coming out. Um, this is really really cool. This is an adventure. Primarily, so it's a region. There are some dungeons, but there are some monsters, weapons, and items. It's more it's more adventure than supplement, but it certainly is um, really really cool. And it's the first again of a series of, of zines that's going to be coming out that detail this setting, I think. Um, and uh, I you know, got a, a sneak peek, a sneak peek at the second zine. It looks really really cool. This was also sent over to me very generously by the creator, so thank you for that. The third one is going to be the player companion for Shadow Dark, which I was not sent. I picked it up on DTRPG. And I want to cover this one in, in a little bit of detail at the very end. Uh, this is essentially a supplement, player-facing supplement. So it has tons of player options in terms of classes, new ancestries for Shadow Dark, and weapon options, new gear options, and new optional supplemental rules for items and things. It's really, really interesting, and it has a bunch of great ideas that I want to talk about. But first, let's go back to Letters from the Dark, Volume 8, Lucky Stars. This is a science fantasy supplement. Now, each of these Letters from the Dark has been a different theme. Um, this one is science fantasy, Star Trek Enterprise, basically, right? Uh, and I, you know, some people don't like science fantasy. Some people don't want that science fiction element in their game. I like it. I like it quite a lot. And if you're interested in that, then this supplement is for you. Just like all of the other ones, all of the other letters from the dark, there's a great introduction. This one's from Chat RPG, where uh, the creator is trying to get it to write an intro for this, and it won't write it. It keeps trying to give uh, a recipe instead. That's great. Here's the table of contents for the final product, and you have essentially kind of two adventures. I'll talk about that a bit more, but you have the encounter at Korolov Pass with a dungeon, which is, uh, so it's, it's a couple dungeons actually. There's a mine, and then that leads into a dungeon crawl aboard a, a crashed starship, the Zenith. And then there is a virtual reality dungeon plugged in at one point in the ship, and you can plug in any adventure you want into that virtual reality adventure. But... It also has one uh, kind of plugged in, and it's an old school adventure. You'll see it as we go through. It's pretty great. So the art is one of the things I wanted to highlight here. This is fantastic. This looks like the old pulp magazine covers to me. It's done in a slightly different, you know, artistic style, but the but the uh, content and the poses and the you know what's being depicted is very much straight out of those, uh, you know, those um, pulp magazine covers. I love it. Absolutely great. We have a couple of those in this. A preview product. You'll see. I'm sure there are more in the full version, but you get a great uh, description of genre and how this supplement fits in. The kind of technology you're going to be getting and the gadgets you can get. The aura in a can, auto aim, babble tongue, some aliens, right? The reptiloid, the Yithian, Zeta. Now again, remember this is a preview ed uh, edition, so you're going to get different uh, and more complete things in the full version. This is great too. <laughs> you have some, uh, you know, this is again classic pulp art there. Uh, the Encounter at Korolov Pass. This is a science fantasy adventure for fifth level characters, so it's fairly high. Um, you have some things, again, that are uh, redacted, and when you want to click on them, it'll take you to the full version on DTRPG. Uh, so you have potential hooks for lawful, neutral, chaotic characters. That's a really cool idea. I'd like to see more of that in adventures. And then you have the breakdown of the different regions. So Cosmograd, which is the village, the mine itself, and then the zenith, which is the crashed starship down there. Here's the, uh, the distance and the map of the region. Cosmograd with the rumors and town history and a brief breakdown of the different locations in town. And then you have the mine itself. There's all its history, the intrigue of there, what's going on. There's a mystery happening. And then crawling, how you crawl through it with light, you know, construction, all of that. Here's a breakdown of the uh, mine map and you can see the inner, the, the, you know, the, the, um, the zenith, uh, not interposed, is that the right word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, positioned on top of it relative to it, so you can see where it is relative to the uh, to the mine. The random encounters, 
uh, lots of cool ones here, some traps. They're kind of like, again, some of them are more normal, but then you have these uh, laser cannon traps, right? The automatic cannon of, uh, on the zenith sticking through the wall, it fires at living creatures, so you gotta be very careful. Um, there's some possible solutions, but obviously it's gonna be up to you, how do you or how, to your players, how they solve it. Uh, there's the tractor beam and the glowing pool of uh, radio, radiation fuel, radioactive fuel. You can get levels of radiation, and that's one of the things that this dungeon has, is sort of levels of radiation, and you can reduce them by doing certain things in the ship. Here's the Zenith, the dungeon crawl through an alien spaceship. It's a big dungeon. It's, uh, you know, it's quite large, and that's really cool. It's not just like a tiny little dungeon. It's not just a few rooms. You're looking at not quite a mega dungeon, right? It's not over 100 rooms, but it's pretty high. You can see the number of rooms here. Uh, 12, 22, 32, 43, 63, uh, 78 rooms. That's pretty good. 78 rooms is a, is a very decent sized dungeon. Um, that's awesome. That's awesome. So here's the Zenith, a great piece of art here. It shows it broken down in different places. This looks like a computer uh, console, right? This looks like a, an old screen and that's how some of this art is throughout. And not all of it. I, I would rather actually much more of it were like this, at least of what we have in the preview. Um, but I like it a lot. There's the teleporter pass, so you can get your teleporter pass stamped essentially and allow access to different parts of the, the ship. You can't just get to anywhere right away. Here's security and what's going on in the dungeon. I love these sorts of maps. Again, I, I, I hope that in the full version this is sort of the, the, the go-to map of the dungeon because it's so great. It looks like a screen readout. Looks so good. Really, really good. Uh, this is uh, other. This is the, the regular look you might say of the of the um, letters from the dark zines. Look more like this standard Shadow Dark, you know, font and, and uh, presentation. You have robots. You have uh, metal skinned aliens. Um, you've got teleporters, you've got toilets. You have an armory with lots of laser weapons. Medical bay. Uh, virtual reality deck. This is the this is awesome. So there's a simulation, right? That the, the growl of the Grimlow is the one plugged in, but you could use any adventure if you want. That's really great. And here is the, the Zetacom Zetacom Games, um, you know, uh, game the, uh, the the game cartridge that you put into the uh, the Zenith virtual reality deck, Growl of the Grimlow, which is a fantasy adventure, which is really funny. But it's done in the style of like a Calabeth or old old adventure games, right? where you're, you're really just reading through descriptions. Um, like, indeed, you've just arrived in a town when you hear the queen issue a plea for help. The king has been kidnapped by drow. Are you a bad enough adventurer to rescue the king? Right, that's like bad dudes. How do you respond? Indeed, we shall go into the spooky forest. Of course, let's go to where every adventure begins, the local library. Meh, let's stay here and get drunk at the tavern. Or no. If you say no, it's just game over. That's great. And then we have the preview for the very next, the, there's the preview cover for the very next Letters of the Dark, Volume 9, which is Book of the Dead. It's about the sort of an Egyptian-themed thing. I am going to be all about that one, let me tell you. Um, so that is the full preview PDF, Lucky Stars, which is Letters from the Dark, Volume 8. If you're interested in science fantasy, I highly recommend you guys check this one out. I think it's really cool. Thanks again to Chris for sending it over to me. The next one is, as I said, Righteous Vow, which is volume one of a new zine set, which is going to be uh, released soon. Now, I think there's a sort of a special edition run of the print versions of this book. Um, it's kind of all all out. Um, I just have the PDF, and uh, if you, but I'll put links below to where you can get more information about the full thing. We can get the the uh, um, not that this PDF isn't full; it's full, but I mean the print version and all that stuff. I'll put links below to where you can get it on DTRPG or on um, their website. So as I said, it's primarily an adventure, and it's a big one. This is 72 pages of PDF, and most of that is the adventure. Uh, it's sort of a setting. You get the Kingdom of Ul, where there is this uh, Lich King who is now reigning over it, or has reigned over it. Uh, he sealed a bunch of um, uh, sealed a bunch of his old family into a bunch of his fortresses, and you're trying to find his son, the one that his son was was slain in. And so you have a whole bunch of different fortresses essentially. Um, there's tons of treasure, lots of undead, um, and you're trying to clear it out for these dwarves. Uh, so you're trying to find the son of the terrible king, and that will lead you to the crypt of the king himself, because the map and the key are hidden with the sun. This is great. This is really, really great. There's essentially a bunch of manors, and then uh, a bunch of dungeons, and here's the map of the region. Now, um, this is a pretty big region. These are these is, Hexus is five miles. And only these places are detailed. 
So there's the town, there's a witch's hut, and then there's each of the fortresses. Everything else would be up to you to detail, but you could add in tons of stuff, or you could add this into another world if you're interested. Because there's just dungeons here, and there could be standalone dungeons, or they could be dungeons that are um, added in something else. Great. But if you want, and I would, I'll say this now, and I'll say this again at the end, I'm sure. But this is a very um, solid, uh, I would say, like, leaning into what makes Shattered Ark, Shattered Ark kind of adventure, right? It's like dealing with torch timers, you know, delving through tombs, finding treasure, dealing with traps, rolling random encounters, fighting monsters, mostly, you know, with an undead focus. It is solid, standard, and I mean that in, an, in like a positive way, solid, standard D&D Shadowed Ark. That is how I would describe this. You're not going to run across these crazy, you know, weirdness. You're not going to run across these like, whoa, that's so bizarre. Um, you're not doing a whole bunch of role-playing, you're not doing a whole bunch of staying... I mean, and when I say role-playing, I mean like there's not a ton of NPCs and factions to interact with. That's not what you're looking at. You're looking at dungeon crawling, killing monsters, getting loot. Uh, there's some rumors and encounters. And I, that's, by the way, that's not to say there is no role-playing. There, there is, but it's not the focus. This is, this is the focus is, you know, dungeon crawling. Um, you have the different descriptions of each of the fortresses. Um, I think they're called manors on the first page. They're called fortresses here. Um, it might be better to, to map those terms together, and it might be better to name them rather than just simply say, um, uh, but, but the thing is you can choose, you can move them around. That's the thing, right? So you can do fortress, you can move the fortresses and the dungeons to where you want. You don't have to have them be any specific place on the map, which is also pretty cool. I think that's why they're generic. I might make that more specific and just say, here's where this one is, here's that where that one is. But again, um, that's going to be up to you at the table. You can arrange them however you want. Now there are new monsters for this, which are really cool. There's the Lich King himself, and he's got a very powerful stat block for Shadow Dark, very powerful with a magic item, the Black Diamond. That's his uh, phylactery, I believe. Um, you have Skeletal Warrior, Skeletal Knight, Skeletal Archer, Skeletal Mages, and then Skeletal Dogs and Yarn Dolls, plus the Skeletal Cyclops and the Crypt Crab. So lots of new creatures if you want to add them into your Shadow Dark game. That's great. Lots of different skeletons. It's fun. Um, we just have the basic shell, the skeleton in Shadow Dark, so this gives us a bunch of new options. And then some new magic items. Some of them are really powerful. One of them is Cursed. They're pretty fun. I like them a lot. And then you get, again, throughout, the art is just fantastic. I love these pieces of art. Uh, really, really draws you into this setting. Really, really great um, tonal pieces. I like it a lot. Then you have the description of each of the dungeons. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go through a few just to give you a sense of what they're like. But the, the layout is pretty standard Shadow Dark layout. And by that, I mean it's, it's, it's proficient, readable, and easy to move through. You have um, the headings, you have bolded points, you have italicized, you have uh, monsters that are highlighted. It's broken down pretty easily. The maps aren't repeated as frequently as I'd like. Um, you kind of have to flip around to get to the maps, but the art is really good. As you can see there, that's a great piece of art. Um, and the dungeons themselves are very interesting. Again, it's lots of treasure, lots of traps, lots of monsters to fight. A few puzzles, a few pieces of role-playing here and there, but it's mostly dungeon crawl. That's what you're working on. Um, it's a good note here, Fortress Duncan. This fortress is the best place to start if you begin if you're starting the adventure with level one players. Uh, if this dungeon is located later in the adventure, you can always bolster the encounter rolls up to once per round to heighten the danger, so you can increase the difficulty. Here are the maps, and they're really well laid out. Um, I like how linked they are, how looped they are. That's pretty cool. I will say this about the maps: is that the way that they're drawn and the way that they're colored, it's it's not high contrast, and so you actually have to kind of look around to find doors. You kind of can get a little lost in what's being actually described. I find that that's not to say it's hard, but but it's it's not just like an easy at a glance, you know, high contrast black and white map or something or blue and white map or something like that. The grays and the shades of grays make it a little bit harder to read just just as a quick eye scan. And because it's not repeated very frequently, um, you know, you're going to have to be jumping back to it. It's not just at a glance as quick as you could otherwise see. Now, that being said, I love that everything is depicted on the map. And you'll see that again and again through these dungeons, is that the things that are in the room are shown on the map. And so you have, once you've read through it, once you've understood the map, then you just glance back at it and you will remember what was there. Oh yeah, that's this room. Oh yeah, that's that room. And it'll be easier to map up to the description of the room. That's cool. Once again, you get mimics, you get lots of cool stuff. Um, some connections from one dungeon to another. <clears throat> uh, some of the dungeons are fairly small, like this one. Some of them are much bigger. But they are all... a uh, great piece of art there. Really, really great. They are all... Um, they're all really cool. And I like these dungeons quite a bit. 
So again, I'm not going to flip through the whole thing. Uh, I'm just going to stop about there. Uh, this is about halfway through the book, but you can see that there are tons and tons of dungeons. Uh, Righteous Vow, Volume 1. I highly recommend you guys check this out. Um, volume 2 uh, sounds really cool, too. I think it's going to be set in the underground kingdom with a bunch of rats and things like that. Uh, it sounds very... And actually, this is the tone I get from this very much. It feels very Warhammer fantasy. It feels very, very old school. It feels a little grim and grim dark. Um, feels like Hero Quest, which is right up my alley. This is my vibe. So you can see this being like a Hero Quest series of adventures. And in fact, the fact that it's sort of similar dungeons broken up into different locations and therefore different quests, basically, feels a bit like the speed and pacing of Hero Quest, which again is my jam. I love Hero Quest. So anyway, I hope you guys check out Righteous Vow Volume One. I'll, I'll put links below to where you can get it in print and uh, on DTRPG and all that. And thank you once again to the creators for sending it over to me. I'm very, really, really happy with it. The last one I want to cover is the player companion for Shadow Dark. Uh, this is 114 pages, pages essentially, of player-facing options. Now, I have my quibbles about player-facing options in any game. My, my, my experience, and I think a lot of DMs and GMs' experiences with player-facing options in 5th edition was disastrous, right? It's one of the reasons why many of us moved away from Shadow, oh, from 5th edition to Shadow Dark, was to get away from so many player-facing options, right? Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and Mordenkind's Tome and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Volo's Guide and all of these different things that added more and more options, more and more feats, more and more spells, more and more races and classes to play. The, the more and more options you add, the more combinations you have, the more likely someone's going to find something, some combination that, that is overpowered relative to the level of the game. And in 5th edition, it was just easy to do. So when you add in player-facing options, which this book has tons, it's 114 pages of player-facing options, you're very likely to find some things that are imbalanced, that are overpowered relative to the game, and some things that are underpowered relative to the game. And let me tell you, this book has some of that. So I can't just outright recommend everything that this book has in it. I would never use much of the stuff in this book simply because it's too powerful. It trivializes elements of the game. It overwhelms and, and stands in for the base classes or the base races or makes them just better. You see that with the elves, for example. Um, the gold elf here. Um, I think it's the gold elf. I might be wrong about that. Um, but I think I'm not. No, the gold elf is essentially just an upgraded elf from Shadow Dark. You get both bonuses to ranged combat and spellcasting checks instead of one or the other. If you look at the dark elf, for example, <laughs> dark elves are uh, resistant to all magic, so they impose disadvantage on all spellcasting checks made against them. Well, that is really, really strong, right? And if you just open up this book to your players and say, hey, have some, have some stuff. Well, they're going to find the most powerful stuff in here. The Dragonborn essentially gets a longbow just built in. Slotless longbow that you can use regardless of class with their breath attack. Um, that's just really strong. And so, again, if you're just going to open this up to everybody else, to every player, everything in this book, then the players are going to find the most powerful stuff and they are going to use it. They're going to use it. Players just tend to do that, right? So you need to be... Um, you need to be careful. Mountain Orcs, for example, gain plus two against melee attacks in combat. So you get a, a, a Mountain Orc in plate with a shield, he's going to have 17 AC, which in Shadow Dark is incredibly high. Maybe even 19 AC, right? Yeah, because that would be 15 for the armor, 17 for the shield, 19. Yeah, 19 for that. That's just really, really strong, right? Really strong. So keep in mind that you're going to be having... Uh, that, that granted, you're not going to probably have plate from level one. But as soon as you get plate armor, that guy or character is going to be very, very, very good. <laughs> very hard to kill. Um, wood elves make bow attacks with advantage, right? So all of your all of your bow attacks are with advantage. Okay, right. So when, again, when I'm talking about these races, we're talking about overpowered relative to the base classes. Now, uh, so far, it sounds like I've been pretty critical, and I have been pretty critical, right? But my point here is not to just say this is not good and you shouldn't do this. Obviously, if you're if you're looking to power up your game, you can certainly use these features. I've said this before about other sh Shadow Dark player-facing supplements, right? If you're okay with a higher power level, if you want a higher power level, you want your players to have more options, you want your players to be moving more in the direction back towards 5th edition just a little bit, then, then this book and books like this are for you. Um, but the reason I want to highlight this is because I think a lot of players, a lot of GMs, don't give enough thought to adding back in extra classes because there are so many right now, right? You go on DTRPG, 
There are tons of free or pay what you want classes, tons of classes that are like a dollar, a dollar fifty, tons of collections of classes that are like five dollars, eight dollars. First of all, it's fairly easy to make your own class. You know, that's a whole other conversation. So I would, I would, I would, you know, I would tend to advise people to make your own class that fits your setting. But the balancing act, act is hard, which is why most people don't want to do it. So people take you know classes online and they think, oh, that's perfect, right? There's no paladin in the base book. Um, I want to find a paladin online and I want to add them in. There's a paladin in this book, for example. Um, uh, maybe there isn't in this one. No, there is no paladin in this one. Well, that's that's actually good, and I, it come, brings up a point. Um, I've been looking through a lot of supplements recently, so there's no paladin in this book. But um, but they think, for example, that there's no paladin in the base book, and so they'll take a paladin class and they'll add it in. But what they don't realize, of course, is that there is a paladin class in the base book. It's the cleric. It's the priest. If the priest takes paladin spells, namely shield of faith, smite, you know, a holy weapon, then they essentially are a paladin. They play like a paladin. They wear armor, they run up in the front line, they attack, they cast their spell smite, they cast their spell shield of faith. They're, they're basically paladins. They turn undead and they fight, but other than that, they're, they're paladins. Um, if they want to be more healy, then they take the healing spells. Right, if you want to play a, a wizard who's an elementalist, then you're taking Melf's Acid Arrow and Fireball and, and, and um, uh, Burning Hands. If you're playing a wizard who's more of a, you know, a, an illusionist, then you're taking Charm Person and Minor Illusion and those other spells, right? The things that are more sneaky, invisibility. So um, if you want to play a necromancer, right, you pick the spells that relate to the dead or raising the dead, although there aren't that many. But the point is, the base game sort of assumes that you can play towards the class that you want by picking your spells that way. If you're a warrior and you want to play an archer, well, you take the dex and you pick a favorite weapon to be a bow and you fight that way, right? And then you're an archer. So rather than having a class that's called archer, you just take the warrior and you take your favorite weapon to be a longbow and you start with a longbow and you buy quivers of arrows and you fight that way. And you use your extra constitution slots to hold extra quivers, right? I mean, like whatever it is. You use the class to get at this final class. So looking at the archer then, you say, well, okay, so I get plus one to attack and damage with longbow. If I pick a warrior, I get that automatically. If I pick quiver, if I have a high constitution, I get to add that to my to my carrying capacity anyway, so I might have a couple extra classes because warriors get to, or fighters get to add in extra con points. So if I have a high con, I get to add that in anyway. So my point here is not to say, hey, this doesn't do anything, because clearly it does. You get the called shot, you get taken cover advantages, you, re you reduce the number of weapons you can use, right? You get you reduce the amount of armor you can use, so it certainly is a trade-off. But my point is, if, if, what you're, if what you're really trying to get at with these new classes is the vibe, right? You have a player who says, I want to play an archer, you have that in the base classes, right? And this is, this is a change in mindset. This is what I've, I've talked about in my, in my breakdown of Shadow Dark, and I'm going to break it down here, but the more you point to class character sheet solutions for things, the more you point to that and you say, that's how we're going to play the game. You're going to have a specific ability called taking cover. You're going to have a specific ability called called shot. You're going to have a specific ability called draw. The more we add towards the players, player facing options that are on their character sheet, the less likely they are to try these things on their own. So if I had a player who said, hey, can I shoot at his legs and try to slow him down? I don't actually want to hurt him. I just want to slow him down. I'd be like, sure, make a check. Let's let's do this, right? Let's make a check. You can do it. Of course, anyone can try that. If you're like, can I try to shoot his hand to get him to drop his bow? I might be like, yeah, well, that's a pretty hard shot. Uh, if you succeed, I'll make him make a check. And it's an opposed check to basically disarm him from a distance. Great. Awesome. Okay, can, can I try to... Um, you know, maybe do a little extra damage. It's, I don't understand that one, the called shot, because it seems like you're always trying to maximize damage, so I don't really understand how a called shot should do more damage. It's like, okay, I'm really going to try to hurt him this time. It's like, well, you're always trying to do that. Anyway, leaving that one aside. Uh, but the others seem to make sense to me. I would just say you can do that anyway. Right? I would just say you can do that anyway. Now, this is just one example. The archer, they're not all like the archer. Sometimes they're more powerful. Sometimes they do things that other classes do in a slightly different way, like the assassin, basically sort of a, a thief that focuses just on the assassin and assassinate and backstab stuff. So there's that. So there are some classes, like the archer, the paladin, which is not in here, granted, but, but those sorts of classes that you see in supplements, those sorts of supplements that just simply miss the, miss the point of the base game, right? <laughs> they miss the fact that you can do these things already. And that by leaning into character sheet solutions, you're leaning right back into 5th edition land. Even if, uh, right, so basically, how to put it, 
the more you encourage players to look to their sheet for, for, for terms that they can then use in the game world to affect the game world, the less likely they are to be creative and try to solve things themselves using non-character sheet solutions, player solutions. And that's fine. That's a, certainly it's a style of play. It's again, it's fifth edition. It's the way fifth edition went. And I think that a lot of players, a lot of GMs, want that. They want a simplified version of fifth edition. So they want character sheet solutions. Great. More power to you if that's what you're interested in. But keep that in mind. That's all I'm saying, right? That's this. This is think of this as a PSA. <laughs> that's what this is. Um, if you add in these supplements with character sheet solutions that do specific things that you probably could already do in Shadow Dark if you thought about it. If you said, "Hey, I want to try this. Can I try this?" Then then you're going to be less likely to try that. Because if, if my, the other player has an ability called called shot, well, then I'm never going to try it. Because it's, it's his ability. It's something he can do with his class. Well, I'm not going to try that then. So I can't try it. So character sheet solutions actually limit play. They don't seem like they do, but they actually do. So the more you add them in, the more you're the less likely you are to have that sort of creative ad hoc, hey, what am I going to try to do to solve this? What will I try to do to solve this? What would I do in this situation? You're going to have less of that. Again, it's not a binary. It's not either or, but it is a spectrum. You're moving further down on one side or the other. That's one kind of supplemental class that I've seen a lot of. And I see a few of those here, but not all of them. The other half are those classes that genuinely fill roles that aren't found in the base game. And, and part of the reason for that, of course, is that they're setting-specific or they're tone-specific or maybe they're slightly more powerful than some of the base ones and they re replace them. And that's totally fine. But again, what I would do is I would find the ones that you are, you're interested in, right? So the Beastmaster might fit a certain kind of campaign or the Berserker, the Brigand, the Buccaneer, the Burglar, the Charlatan, the Conjurer. I would find the ones that fit with the tone of game that you're trying to play, your campaign, and add those in rather than just say, here is all of the players, right? So pick eight classes. Replace the fighter with the brigand. Replace the thief with the assassin. Replace the wizard with the conjurer and add in three more, right? And you say, okay, these are the classes that we can use in this setting. These are the classes we can use in this campaign. That's the way I would use this sort of book. Think of this as not, here's all of the new options for the players, but here's an encyclopedia of options that I, as a GM, can draw from to fit a tonal campaign. That's what I like these sorts of supplemental books for. Again, not for the fact that this is now just player facing, I'm going to hand this out to my players and say go, but rather be like, okay, what are the classes that I could use in my game to reinforce the tone and the theme and all of that? I'll add those in and I'll take out the ones that don't fit. And that's it. So in this campaign, we can play enchanters, conjurers, wizards, um, and mages. You can pick one of the four spellcasting classes, and that's it. We're going to do, so we're doing a wizard school. We're doing a wizard academy. You can't play a non-casting class, but not everyone has to be wizards. They can still get different abilities. Okay, great. That works, right? That sort of thing. We're doing, you can be a mariner, a buccaneer, a thief, or a brigand, right? We're doing a, a, a we're doing a, a, or a mystic, right? We're doing an on, we're doing an on the seas campaign. Or you can be, you know, whatever, a pugilist, a hand of rogue a savage, and a scholar. Pick a few and add them into your game if you like what they do. But keep in mind that a lot of these are going to be variations on things that you can already do. And if they're not, they're either going to fill roles that aren't in the base game, usually for tonal reasons, or they're going to step on the toes of one of the base classes. You're probably going to use them to replace the base classes. Because again, if you have the option of this more powerful thing and the base less powerful thing, well, they're going to choose the more powerful thing. Okay, so these are the classes. You guys get a sense of what they're like. They're pretty cool. And again, there's a huge variety here. There's 114 pages of things. Now, one of the things I wanted to point to is the gear. I really like the adventuring gear. There's a whole bunch of new options, and they all do something, which is cool, right? So there's a property that it does, and it adds a little bit of something to the point. Um, and some of them are easy, some of them are harder, but you get the, you get the, uh, you know, there's a whole list of new abilities. And I think that's cool, like a lodestone, for example. That's a cool new piece of gear. I'm fine with this sort of thing because it takes up slots. It has a cost, literally. <laughs> it has a cost that you have to pay. And it's not, none of these are going to be like incredibly powerful. None of these are going to be like break the game. They're all just basic adventuring gear, adding it. That's cool. It's, that's stuff you could already do. This makes it easier for you. The other thing is the armor. There's a whole bunch of new armor. Each of them do slightly different things, right? So there's a difference between hide and leather. There's a difference between chainmail and brigandine or brigandine. There's a difference between field plate and full plate. They do slightly different things. Like full plate is 16 AC. It's very, very strong. Field plate is 15 AC. And you don't get disadvantage on stealth. 
So different things like that. Um, studded leather is different than leather, right? Leather is an 11, studded leather is a 12. But studded leather doesn't give you a dex modifier, whereas leather does, right? So things like that. Uh, so lots of really cool ideas there. And then the weapons. The, uh, this is another thing that this book does, which is that some of the weapons are given special abilities. Not all of them, but some of them. Um, and uh, those special abilities tend to be pretty strong. So for example, if you have a, a rapier in one hand and a dagger in the other, you get a plus two AC against any melee opponents. And you can use strength or dex to use this weapon, whichever is greater. So it becomes kind of uh, you know a finesse weapon. Uh, it's only a d4 damage, which is good, because that's part of the problem, is you don't want to create a dex build that's as strong or stronger than fighters. Right? You never really want to do that um, in the Shadow Dark mindset. Um, and so there's no, fortunately, there's no finesse weapon that does d6 or d8 or something like that. I think, I think that's good. So again, these are things you could add in. I remember I used to use the, um, there were special weapon rules that Kobold Press released one time, um, Beyond, Beyond Critical Hits, I think is what it was called. And it was early on in 5th edition, and I used it for all the 5th edition weapons. And it basically gave every 5th edition weapon two or three abilities they could use, two, three, two or three action abilities. And it was cool, but it was definitely overpowered. This is not necessarily overpowered as far as I can see, but there are special abilities here, and I can think, I think that some DMs are going to be like, awesome, this gives my players a few more options in combat. Again, written character sheet options, rather than can I try this options, right? And I think so... I'm, I tend to not like these sorts of things because I'm like, well, hey, if my player argues, hey, I'd like to try to um, trip up my opponent with my whip here, um, then uh, can I do that? Can I try to throw a trident such that uh, I, I actually just twist it? Or can I use the trident to twist the weapon out of his hand and try to disarm him with it? It's like, great. Um, okay, so things like that. Uh, then the last thing I wanted to point to are these, it's a really interesting idea here. Uh, there's plants and poisons and toxins and things like that, but I don't want to, I mean, that's fine, traps and things like that. Uh, spell catalysts. That's what I wanted to talk about, spell catalysts. It's a really cool idea. So essentially it's this idea that you can power up your spells by holding a particular reagent in your offhand, which is consumed. So if you're a wizard and you want to prepare a certain kind of magic and make it a little stronger, for example, balsam, it's a chunk of aromatic resin exuded from flowing tree, by flowering trees. If held by it while casting Alarm, it consumes the item and raises the duration to 1d3 plus 2 days. That's great. That's cool. It will, all of these certainly, right, power up each of the spells. So up to you if you just want to have your players have access to all of these. But it would be a cool way of boosting up the power of the spells. Now, if you didn't want to necessarily make this overpowered, you could, you could increase the cost of this. You could limit the amount of uses it could do. You could... You could make the difficulty of casting the spell change, or you could simply change the effect to grant advantage on the casting or something like that. Um, you could do whatever you wanted, but this idea is a really good one of, of giving players the choice to take on a little extra burden, but to make their spells a little bit more powerful when they go off. I think that's cool. And there's a whole bunch of different spells, tons and tons and tons, as you can see. Tons of different spell catalysts and how they affect each of the spells. Uh, it's a D100 table, not all of them, are, and it's not 110 entries because some of them have two, but still, very, very good. I think that's cool. All right, so this is the player companion for Shadow Dark. I'll put links below to where you can get it on DTRPG. And again, I think that as a collection of adventures, or as a, as a collection of player-facing options, it's one of the better ones out there. It's certainly one of the more comprehensive ones out there. It has a ton. On the other hand, it does raise the power level of the game, and in some cases, significantly. So if you were to open this up to your players and say, go for it, well, I think your game is going to change significantly in terms of its power level. You're going to have to do a lot more work to balance the game relative to the base game. That's fine. Some people don't mind that. Some people want that actively. So if you're in that camp, then go for this. But what I would say is, and this is again a PSA for people who are using Shadow Dark maybe, consider the effect on your game of any supplement you add. And probably the, the, the effect on your game is going to be to move it in the direction of 5th edition. It's going to move it probably in the direction of character sheet solutions rather than player solutions because there's nothing stopping a particular player from asking you as a dm hey if i wanted to boost up the power of my spell or i wanted to increase the duration is there any way i could do that and the dm could say hmm you know there are some rituals there are some in-game things you could do and try it's risky but you could try it. right there are you could a, a clever player who wants to do that thing if you're a dm who's willing to work with players then you can already do that so to codify it and, and put it down as a set rule, if you have this thing, you can, you can use up the resource and you can do the thing, right? That's, that's moving in the direction of player, uh, player char character sheet solutions. And I'm just generally not a fan of those. 
So keep that in mind. If you are, totally fine, right? Obviously, it's, it's, it's your table. You play the game. You want to play it and forget how I, how I recommend it, what I recommend. But anyway, I think the important thing is to, just to know. To, be, to foreknow is to be forearmed, or to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Something like that. All right, guys, well, I hope this has been interesting. We've looked at Player Companion for Shadow Dark, The Righteous Vow, Volume 1, and Letters from the Dark, Volume 8, Lucky Stars. I'll put links below to where you can get them all. All right, guys, see you all in another video.